Hi, welcome to episode 4 of the Linux Shelter and uh, let's get started with the releases. Uh, we start off with Audacity 2.1.0 Release Candidate 3. If you don't know what Audacity is, it's a really good uh, audio recording and editing uh, suite. Uh, I've used it, it's like I said, it's really good. Uh, 2.1.0 Release Candidate 3 has new effects and they've tweaked the interface and they've added Armenian translations which is great if you use it in Armenia. I'm not sure how big that market is but translations are good. I don't think we have enough of that in Linux. Uh, we all know that the documentation in Linux varies from great to non-existent so anyone that's doing it translations and documentation that's good. I like that. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Zential Server 4.1. And as you may guess, this is a server distro. Um, it comes with Active Directory support, it comes with Exchange support, and it is aimed at Enterprise, which is good if you're running an Enterprise server. Hmm. I probably won't check that out, but you know, I like to cover all the distributions. Um, I'm not really huge on enterprise server distros because I don't have an enterprise, but yeah, it's cool. I know there are a lot of people that use enterprise uh, distros, and it's Linux development is good where, wherever it is. Um, next up, Voyager 14.04.4x. It uses the latest XFCE 4.12, which is very cool. Uh, uses the 3.16 kernel, which is fairly recent, and we'll be talking more about the kernel later. And it looks very interesting. It's supposed to be like a bleeding edge uh, distro, and apparently it's somewhat experimental, but also stable, which is interesting. And I'm definitely going to be checking that out. And we have Ubuntu 15.4 Final Beta. Uh, apparently this is mostly bug fixes and it will be coming out in Kubuntu, Lubuntu, Ubuntu Gnome, Ubuntu Kylin, Ubuntu Studio, Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate versions. So that is pretty much all your major desktops covered. Uh, I personally use this Ubuntu because I... no, I don't use Ubuntu, I use Lubuntu. Uh, yeah, I love XFC and LXDE my words are going so well today um, which is great when you're doing a podcast um, but yeah um, I will almost certainly upgrade to 15.4 when it comes out at the end of next month so yeah definitely worth checking out a beta if you can't wait to get your hands on the latest Ubuntu and yeah I'm probably going to wait for the release candidates or the final release but yeah. Ubuntu is a big important piece of software in the Linux community as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't be running this laptop that I'm broadcasting on now without Ubuntu. So, yay Ubuntu. Um, then we have Nest Server 6.6, .6, which is a CentOS based server designed for specialist servers. I have no idea what that is, um, but I like CentOS. I've used CentOS in the past. It's a good solid OS. Yeah, I again I'm not big on servers because I don't have much that I actually need a server for. But yeah. I know there are people out there that use servers and maybe worth checking out for you if you have a server along with Zential server. Okay, next up, G Parted Live 0 0.22.0-1. It supports reading and writing to disk without partition tables, which is really cool. And it is based on Debian SID. Um, if you don't know what Gparted is, uh, Gparted is a, a tool that you can use to edit disks, format disks, uh, repartition disks. It's very, very cool. You can use it to recover a disk. Um, I use it a fair bit for uh, formatting um, virtual machine hard disks because I use virtual machines a lot 
I use it for formatting uh, USB keys because it's damn fast at that. And I personally think it is a very important piece of software in the Linux community. Um, I'm not going to hide the fact that I really like it. Um, so yeah. And I think if you have a distro that's based around Gparted, that's very cool. Because, you know, we've all had that situation where we screwed up a machine and we need some software to recover that machine. And if you've got Gparted and a distro, you know, running something like Debian Sid, that's cool. And you can stick that on your USB key and just run that and get on with fixing your computer. It's great. Um, okay, next up, Anti-X 14.4. It is again a mostly bug fix release. It uses Debian Wheezy. It is aimed at those who prefer SysV and it rather than SystemD. And I am not getting involved in that holy war. Um, yeah, haven't actually used the system that uses SystemD yet. I guess I'm going to be using it when I upgrade to the next version of Ubuntu, as they are using SystemD. So yeah, I mean that'll be really interesting to look at. Um, yeah, I mean who knows? I might have a look at Anti-X 14.4. Not a hundred percent happy with Ubuntu. Um, I need something as solid as Ubuntu. I've heard good things about Anti-X, so yeah. Okay, and we go from Anti-X to Super-X, and Super-X 3.0, which is another one I really want to look at, because it sounds awesome. Uh, it is designed to open apps fast, it compresses unused memory and then uses it for storage, and it automatically puts your most commonly used apps into the compressed storage in the memory, which I think sounds really cool because this is one of my problems with Ubuntu is that I have found that it uh, takes a long time to load certain apps and these are not apps that I only use occasionally I mean we're talking Chrome, Firefox, Steam they take forever to load and it's actually at the point now on my Ubuntu install where it's faster to play games on Windows than it is on Ubuntu which is weird. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely going to be having a look at SuperX 3.0 because that sounds very interesting. I will definitely be putting that on a virtual machine and giving it a play. Okay, next up, Pingai OS 14.04.2. It's an Ubuntu respin with a custom version of GNOME. It uses kernel it uses the Linux kernel uh, 3.13, which sounds a little old. I mean, that could just be me being picky, but, you know, 3.13, that's a little way back now. But apparently this release should solve the uh, UEFI problems it had in the past, which is always good. And I think I made it pretty clear last week how I feel about UEFI and what a pain in the hole that thing is. Okay, and lastly we have the Debian 8 Jesse installer release candidate 2. Uh, apparently it has made some changes to the way it uses system D. Uh, it, there are fixes for task cell and console setup and it will now also support Banana Pro Maker Board and A20 O Linux Xeno Line 2 and Debian 8 is still actually not available just this installer for it which is odd but hey Debian is another big important project and you know the way I argue it with people no Debian then no Ubuntu no Ubuntu then no Linux Mint and all those projects are really fantastic projects so yeah you should support Debian go Debian Okay, and that's it for the releases. Uh, now, let's move on to the Linux news. And Linus Torvalds has released the 4.0 release candidate kernel. And yeah, I think that's big important news. Um, I haven't actually got around to playing with it yet. 
I keep meaning to because I really want to see what's in the 4.0 release kernel. Uh, apparently it is mostly driver fixes and Linus did have a little s moan, which I know is completely unlike Linus. He is normally just such a friendly, affable guy and he has said that he wished that the kernel release candidates would shrink in each iteration and not stay the same size because this one hasn't actually got any smaller. So yeah, um, I will have a play with that. I may review it next week. I'm not sure. I will almost certainly let you know though. And there is also Shadow Warrior out this week for Linux. I don't know if any of you remember this game. Uh, it came out in 1997. It's um, a remake. The Linux release will be a remake of the 97 game. I played it a lot when I was a kid. I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, it cost forty dollars, which seems kind of pricey to me. I mean, you know, I can buy a game for the uh, PS3 for forty pounds, and I know it's supporting Sony and they're closed source and they're evil and that. Uh, but you know, there are games that just work better on the PS3. I mean, this laptop is not a high-end laptop. It really isn't. And I would hate to see it try to run, you know, like, uh, PS4 games. It would die on those. Um, so yeah, I mean, $40 for a game on Linux, which may or may not work on my machine. It seems a little high. But I'm sure if you've got a Linux gaming rig, then this is a great game, and you should check it out. It's going to be, um, I'm guessing it'll be out on Steam. I don't know. But, you know, I mean, for $40, I would hope it's out on Steam. Um, yeah, if there's a demo available, I may check it out. I probably will check it out, actually. Because I had a lot of fun playing Shadow Warrior when I was a kid. Okay. Next up in the Linux news, Ubuntu are going to enter a partnership with Ericsson for cloud products. Yep, the same Ericsson that used to make mobiles with Sony. Hmm. I had one of those. It wasn't great at all. Uh, they're going to help them virtualize servers using uh, Ubuntu 14.04 LTS, which I'm guessing is probably either going to be the server or the core version. And they are going to be using 14.04 LTS as a base for their cloud system. Uh, and Ubuntu claims that telephone companies are moving more towards open source for their software solutions, which was an interesting claim, I think. Uh, you know, that's. I don't know how much proprietary software there is out there for telephone companies, but. I'm guessing there's a fair bit, and if they're using open source, that can only be a good thing. So yeah, again, yay Ubuntu. Uh, okay, so that's it for the Linux news. Uh, let's move on to the Android news. Uh, OnePlus's Oxygen OS release date has been delayed. It was supposed to be out on the 27th. Uh, they gave away five OnePlus handsets to five forum members uh, to say sorry for the delay, and that's all they said. They haven't said when it's going to be out. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of the OnePlus, and I know that might get me a little bit of hate, but here's the thing. We always complain in the Linux community about fragmentation and how there's, I believe, something like 350 separate Linux OS's. And then you've got all these different versions of Android, which is using the Linux kernel, or parts of the Linux kernel, and it's on all different devices. It's on tablets, it's on mobile, it's on wearables. And then we have, you know, not just the Google version of Android. We've got the Amazon version of Android. We've got the Chinese knockoff versions of Android. 
Now we've got OnePlus and Cyanogen mod. And I just think you're going to run into trouble. I mean, I've run into trouble when I've downloaded APKs for my Kindle Fire. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And it's, you know, it's very frustrating for the end user when you're using something that says, this is Android. And you download something and it goes, this runs on Android. And then it doesn't run. You know, I know Google Play is going some way to addressing that. That it will only let you use uh, packages on devices that support it. But it should be, it will let you use packages on devices that will let you uh, run it well. I mean, I have games on my Amazon Fire and on on my Amazon Kindle Fire tablet, whatever flame metaphor they're going to use for that device. Um, yeah, that run horribly. I've got things on my Samsung Galaxy Tab that run horribly. I've got things on my phone that don't even open. But you can download it because it works on Android. And I really don't think companies like OnePlus are helping this. You know, I know they're supposed to be amazingly spec phones, and I know Cyanogen Mod is a great product, and people support it because it's got things taken out of it that are maybe a bit dubious, but, you know, if you're going to have stuff that doesn't work, eh. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. And we will move on to more Cyanogen Mod news, but they have raised... 80 million uh, dollars and it, that has come from Twitter and Qualcomm and Rupert Murdoch and I think it's cool that something has uh, that someone other than Google has got funding for Android but it kind of goes back to my previous argument that you know you've now got another player and you hear rumblings from people I've heard, I've seen all of these headlines around in the last week. Uh, Cyanogen mod want to take uh, Android from Google. I say, but they make it. You can't take it from them because it's theirs. You, know, you can fork it, but then that's not Android. And then you're going to really confuse people. And also speak to Firefox about how well it works when you go off and make your own OS from mobile or talk to Amazon about how it how successful proprietary Android distros are on a phone okay and it's also a little worrying that Rupert Murdoch now has a stake in something people put on their phones I don't know whether you follow the British news but uh, you know some Murdoch owned papers were hacking phones to listen to voicemails <laughs> and now Rupert Murdoch owns a stake in Cyanogen Mod. <laughs> uh -huh. The headlines kind of write themselves. Okay, now on to uh, other mobile phone news for Android. Uh, there is a phone which has come out called the Oppo phone and it looks like it has no bezel. It's like, I've seen videos of this and I've seen pictures of this and it looks amazing. It really does. It's, it's The screen is the front of the phone and there's no black border around the edge. And, and it looks like something out of Iron Man. Um, I saw a video today of it running. Uh, it seems to run insanely quickly. Um... It, uh, obviously there is a bezel, it's not that they have somehow broken the laws of physics and you don't need a bezel. It does, but it uses trickery to hide the bezel, which is cool. I know there was a phone out last year that pulled off the same thing and apparently it's using the same technology as that. But um, yeah, this phone looks really cool. And it looks beautiful, it runs insanely quickly. So yeah. Okay, um, I'm definitely going to keep an eye on the Oppo phone. Uh, okay, up next, Samsung is bundling 
Microsoft Office with some tablets. Oh. Why? And I have a Samsung Galaxy Tab. And it's cool. I love it. And I use it pretty much daily for all kinds of things. And it sit next it sits next to my bed. I pick it up and I use it to flick through flipboard in the morning. Um yeah. I use it to read the news. I use it to read my Kindle books. It's great. But and this is a huge but Samsung are bastards for bundling shit with their phone uh, with their tablets. I mean good god, the amount of stuff and you can't uninstall it. You know, you could roll it back to the default install, but no, I I want to clear up space on my device. Let me remove it. And that's a problem when you've got something like the Samsung Game Center. You know, that's kind of small. Something like Microsoft Office? That's fucking huge. I don't want Microsoft Office on my tablet. I want to be able to remove it. And I'm not going to be able to remove it. And that's kind of a big deal to me. Because I don't want big ass apps on my tablet that I can't take off. And I think we all know that bloatware is horrible. But at least when it comes with your laptop, you can remove it. You know, imagine if you get all this shit on your laptop. And, you know, they go, oh yeah, you can, um, like, take it back to the factory install, but you can't actually remove it. Yeah, you're stuck with that shit. I think a lot of people would be pissed. And, oh... I hate I hate bundled apps I hate pre-installed stuff mm -hmm. and I know people say well get to one plus one mm -hmm. Ugh. just don't put shit with my tablets and phones ok moving on from that rant uh, Google Glass is not dead despite what the media would love to tell you um, I called this one, um, and the media were going into a frenzy about a month ago, going, ah, Google Glass is dead, yay, see, privacy, privacy, really, if, if you can't see a Google, if you can't spot a Google Glass when it's right in front of you, and you're a tech bod, maybe you should reconsider your career, it's not like they look like normal glasses. It's got a freaking chunk of plastic there. Um, yeah, so it's not dead. Eric Schmidt has come out and he said they're not killing it. Uh, it will be part of a bigger platform and that the department that works on Nest are working with the Google Glass department. Um, I've always thought Google Glass was cool. Um, I was actually hoping with the, you know, the death of Google Glass that people would be trying to sell them on eBay dirt cheap so I could pick one up but apparently not you know, that's my only problem with Google Glass I am not paying £900 for uh, a mobile phone in my eye that's what it is um, it looks cool I'm not paying £900 for that shit though you know? the price needs to come down and to be honest I think people that were saying that Glass was dead didn't really listen to any of the Google presentations I mean they said that the release was going to be an Explorer release and it was to get it out and test it and then they said they were stopping the Explorer program well I, I don't think that meant that the project was ever getting killed I think it meant they were stopping the public testing. Mm, what? Did they think that they were just going to sell test versions for the rest of that product's life? No. I mean, Google are pretty well known for beta testing with the public. I mean, look at Chromebooks. They're constantly getting updated. You know, the version that you get uh, when you buy it in the shop, for a year later it's not the same version. You know, they're testing shit all the time. Um, so yeah, 
Uh, glass isn't dead, it's probably going to evolve. It hopefully is going to cost less than £1,500 to buy it. One, and you know, bring it down to the price of a freaking mobile. Okay, so that's it for the Android news. Uh, let's move on to Apple news, which is going to be hilarious. Okay, Apple have patented using light splitters in cameras. This is a <coughs> this is a technology that is already used in pro cameras. Apparently, it splits the light into different uh, wavelengths, and it can take a crisper photo that way. But apparently, pro cameras are already using this. So, um, if they're already using it, can Apple really patent it? And then, are they going to sue the companies that have been using this? And then Apple didn't sue them, and now it's come out, and now they're going to sue them? Is that going to be a thing? But the thing that got me, I read the article on this, and it said that the effect can be achieved using uh, multiple sensors, or it can be achieved using prisms. Are, are you really going to tell me that Apple was granted a patent for splitting light using a prism? I. I learned this at school. I did it. You shine the light into the prism and it goes. They. The sad thing is, they quite possibly did get granted a patent to be allowed to do that, to patent a prism. Because it's like they just get to go along completely unchecked in what they do. And that's what I see a lot of, you know. Like, we are innovative, we are revolutionary. We have invented the smartphone. You didn't. There were loads before the iPhone. I had them. Windows CE? Hear that? Okay, moving on to Apple pasting shit that already exists. Um, a, the last thing I have, because there's only two things in the Apple News today, um, a 12 year old kid has poisoned her mum, or tried to poison her mum, because she took her iPhone away. There are so many things I could say about this. Apparently, she put bleach into her mum's water for taking her iPhone and her mum smelt bleach and thought that maybe her daughter had just been cleaning so didn't think anything of it and then when she smelt bleach a few days later she realised that it was coming from her water jug and asked her daughter about it and her daughter admitting that she was trying to kill her because she had taken away her iPhone dear god I mean really? You tried to kill your mum because she took away your smartphone? Wow! Wow! Ah... Oh. That is someone that does not like being... out in the free world. That is somebody that wants to be locked up. Jeez. I know that's not really an Apple thing. It involved an iPhone which is an Apple thing, but I read that and I was just like, wow. That is that is kind of the obsession people have with their iPhones these days. I mean, I like my... I have a... I'll show you, because it's right here. Oh. It's a Moto G. It's like 80 quid. I love it. I'm not going to poison someone if they took it away. I frequently leave it at home when I go to work. And I'm like, oh shit, I don't have my phone. Oh well. It's only eight hours I can kind of live with that. I'm not going to kill people because... I'll try to kill people just because I don't have my phone. Get over it. Um, okay, next up. We have Microsoft News. And Microsoft are planning to kill Chromebooks with a $149 Windows 10 laptop. Now, I'm going to surprise a lot of people with this. 
I like this idea. I mean, uh, I don't know, but do you remember netbooks that came out maybe five years ago? And they were kind of like really portable, really slim down laptops that were low power. I think this is pretty much like net, uh, netbooks 2.0. Sounds really good. Um, yeah. So it's basically it's going to be a low spec laptop running Windows, uh, Windows 10. Uh, it's going to be good for web browsing and checking email and social media and that's pretty much all the power it's got. Now, I know people are going to be like, why would you want one of these? Well, think about it. This is great for the Linux community. And yes, we would technically be giving money to Microsoft, but just think about it for a sec. You've got a $150 laptop, so I mean, if it's probably going to be £150 over here, that's still not a fortune. You know, and if you have a trip to America, you can pick one up for, what, a little under £100? That's cool. And a laptop, a proper working laptop for 100 quid. Hell yeah. Um, but then you can stick something like Puppy Linux on it. You know, Puppy Linux uses hardly anything. I use Puppy Linux all the time. It's great. It runs like stink on this laptop, which is like a 64-bit uh, quad-core 2.3 gigahertz laptop. It runs awesomely on it. Um, why not stick? You know, hundred quid. Stick it on a cheap laptop. See how it goes. And there's probably going to be UEFI problems, but you know, there are distros. Uh, there are lightweight distros that get around that. Um, yeah, I think it's a really cool thing. I probably will pick one up. You know, it's it's a cool little laptop to just stick in your bag and take out and, you know, a bit of browsing, a bit of social media, maybe a little coding in cafes. Be great for kids. Stick, um, stick Linux on it. Puppy Linux. Yeah. I'm all for it. Okay, next up. It's not a Microsoft thing, it's a Windows thing. If you change your hardware too often, you can be locked out of Origin. Now, if you don't know what Origin is, it is Electronic Arts or EA's alternative to Steam. You can It's a store, you can buy games, you can download them and play them. I mean, Origin has problems anyway. Um, Apparently you need an always-on interconnect. Yeah, you need a always-on interconnect. Um, you need an always-on internet connection to use Origin. Um, but now, apparently, if you change your hardware too often, you will be logged out. Which is kind of odd. I mean... You know, if you're a hardcore gamer, you're probably going to be upgrading your computer quite a lot. And then, if you change it a lot, you're going to be locked out of the thing where you get where you get your games. That's that doesn't sound great. That doesn't sound like a good thing. Um, yeah, I think I'll be sticking with Steam, thanks, because. Uh, Steam's not always checking what the hardware is on my computer, and besides, I'm always plugging and unplugging shit from USB, and I have a shit ton of USB devices and various things, so, mm, no. No thank you, Origin. Uh, next up, Microsoft and Yahoo are likely to part ways. Um, I think this is really bad. Again, I seem to be sticking up for Microsoft quite a lot this week. That's not good. Um, yeah. Uh, the problem for me is, where are Yahoo going to go? And it's not like they're going to partner with Google. I guess maybe they could partner with Baidu, the Chinese search engine, but mm, that's a whole different set of issues right there. 
Um, I mean, yeah, I think it's really bad to see Yahoo falling on tough times. Uh, you know, I know they've lost a lot of ground to uh, Google in the, like you know the last few years. Um, they're not the major player they used to be in on the internet. Um, and you know, I I have good memories of Yahoo when I started out on the internet, and that was the place you went to get all your searches and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's really really sad to see, you know, that Yahoo may not have a partner for search. Wow. And again, I'm going to stick up for Microsoft in this next story. What is going on? It's like I fell into a parallel universe when I woke up. Um, yeah. If you can see this, uh, dark, big dark circles today. I was up until four in the morning watching. WrestleMania last night. Completely off topic. But anyway, great to see Macho Man Randy Savage and Ducks in the Hall of Fame at last. Okay, um, Skype Translator is getting better. Um, I actually use Skype a fair amount. Um, have done for a really, really long time, like since it came out. Uh, me and my wife went on, met online. Um, and she lived a really long way away, like 5,000 miles away. So we use Skype a lot to communicate, and I still use Skype uh, to talk to my family, uh, well, my in-laws out there, uh, occasionally. And, yeah, you know, not all of them speak English, and the Skype translator is a great thing. I mean, you know, it means me and my mother-in-law can have a conversation and she doesn't need to learn English, I don't need to learn Spanish. This is fantastic. Um, maybe a little lazy on my part, but, you know, it's, it's very cool. You know, we're getting close to the Universal Translator, now that cannot be a bad thing. So yeah, uh, I think the Universal, I think the Skype Translator is an amazing thing. And I think it's really useful for everyday people. Um, you know, I think... Uh, I don't want to get too political. But you have a lot of people with a lot of fear of people speaking their own language in foreign countries. You know, uh, We have it here in the UK where we get people that are terrified that we have Polish people speaking Polish in England. And what are they plotting? Uh, maybe if you can understand what they're saying whole thing becomes less scary or maybe you shouldn't be listening to people's private conversations um, but yeah I think this is a very cool thing um, yeah I really like my, the Skype translator I think it's great props to Microsoft um, eventually it'll get copied and open sourced you know that you know that's going to be a thing and that will be really cool when we have collaborative development on that. I'm going to move on from that because I'm rambling a little bit. Uh, okay, and last up in Microsoft news. Microsoft has registered the .porn domain name for Microsoft. Yay! Oh, God! Who wants to see that? I, I do not want to see... Uh, Steve Ballmer porn. Oh my god. I, I do not want to hear Steve Ballmer screaming developers, 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 developers while his big gut is flapping around. Um, and I, to be honest, I don't want to see Bill Gates porn either. No. Oh god. I don't want to see any Microsoft porn. I'm... There are more interesting people that have registered their dot .porn name uh, in like the last few weeks. Microsoft is not one I want to see, ever. Um, okay, so uh, that is almost an end of the show. Uh, last thing that we have is the app of the week. 
I'm just going to grab my mobile to show you this because I think it's really cool. It's getting a bit of hate uh, on its app page, but I think it's cool. I really, really do. Okay, I'm here. Um, the app of the week this week is Atari Fit, which came out uh, in the middle of last week, I think. Uh, I think it's really cool. I have it on Android. There we are. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, you—it's a fitness tracker, but you and you have there's the there's the workout plans you can have and you can log single exercises and it then uh, let's see yeah so you've got tracker run and select a single exercise and then there's a really exhaustive list of exercises it's way too long for me to show you um, but yeah you get XP like a lot of these things there we go there's the screen again uh, you get XP which then earns you where is it ah, coins and once you have coins you can buy games Apple uh, classic Atari games uh, at the moment there are centipede pong and breakout and it says right there mm -hmm more coming that's cool uh, they have leaderboards they have groups that you can join um, I think this is cool I think this app is really cool I'm going to be using it I love my retro games uh, I have another channel on YouTube called The Flash Gamer which I haven't updated in forever um, yeah I must make, start making videos if I, again but yeah, retro games are really cool for me. And if I can get free retro games for doing exercise, hell yeah. Okay, that is it for this week's show. Um, if you've enjoyed it, leave a comment down below. If you've hated it, leave a comment down below. If you've got any questions, leave a comment down below. Any feedback, comment. And uh, subscribe if you liked the show. I'm not sure if it's over there or over there somewhere there will be subscribe down below as well easier um okay so hope you enjoyed the show i really enjoyed it um i'm experimenting with a few things at the moment with the format of the show so yeah let me know what you think um i know this show was a lot longer than the previous show um so let me know what you think about that as well uh, I kind of enjoyed having a longer show. I think it's good. Um, I'm thinking of doing live shows as well uh, on Hangouts on Air. So you can ask me shit. We can have a more of a conversation type feel to the show. Um, so yeah. Okay. Thank you for watching and see you next